To understand the technique for correct implant positioning in total knee arthroplasty, let's look at some anatomical details. The joint line of the knee is inclined from the horizontal in about three degrees of varus. This means that the tibial plateau slopes medially by this amount. On the femoral side, this is matched by greater bulging of the condyle distally and posteriorly. The normal anatomical pattern has important implications for resection. In what is known as anatomical resection, the bone cuts parallel to the anatomical slope of the joint line. In this way, equal amounts of bone will be removed medially and laterally. The bone cuts will be in about three degrees of varus, with reference to the mechanical axis of the lower limb. In the femur, this applies in flexion and in extension. In other words, the same thickness of bone will be removed everywhere. Since a uniform thickness of bone is removed to match the thickness of the implant, the knee replacement should be well balanced in flexion and in extension. Most modern instruments, however, are designed for what is known as classic or standard resection rather than for anatomical resection. Here the bone cuts are at right angles to the mechanical axis of the lower limb, resulting in asymmetrical resection of the tibia and the femur. However, in extension, the different resection heights will even out and the gap will be rectangular. But what about the flexion gap? The tibia is asymmetrically resected with less bone removed medially and more bone removed laterally. The posterior femoral cuts are made parallel to the posterior condylar line. This produces a trapezoidal gap in flexion. This pattern may be an important cause of premature postural medial wear of the polyethylene insert. The problem may be overcome by what is known as corrected classic resection. This involves making the distal femoral and the tibial cuts asymmetrically, that is to say at right angles to the mechanical axis. In order to produce a rectangular gap in flexion as well, the posterior femoral cut must include an alignment correction by external rotation to match the anatomical three-degree joint line slope. This correction produces asymmetrical resection of the posterior femoral condyles to provide compensation in flexion of the tibial asymmetry and a rectangular flexion gap. In advanced varus or valgus osteoarthritis, there will be bony defects in the femur, which will need to be taken into account in the planning of the bone cuts. In such cases, the posterior condylar line will no longer be a reliable reference for the rotational alignment of the posterior femoral bone cuts. That is why more consistent landmarks should be used instead.
two reference lines have proved particularly useful for this purpose. The transepicondylar axis, or incel line, connects the medial and the lateral epicondyle. The posterior cut is made parallel to this line. Additionally, there's the so-called AP axis, or white side line. It connects the deepest part of the patellar groove anteriorly with the center of the intercondylar notch posteriorly. The AP axis is virtually always at right angles to the transepicondylar axis. These landmarks allow the femoral component to be positioned in correct rotational alignment and to obtain better centering of the patella. Correct tracking of the patella is determined by the alignment of the tibial component. Above all, internal rotation of the tibial component must be avoided since it would result in external rotation of the tibial tubercle. This in turn would lateralize the patella and make it prone to instability. In the tibia, too, there are landmarks to guide the surgeon. The most reliable landmarks are the medial border or the junction between the medial and central one-thirds of the tibial tubercle, which is readily identified and which determines the correct tracking of the patella. Use of the center of the ankle joint or of the metatarsals as landmarks is inadvisable, since it may lead to malrotation. If the limb is held in a footholder, the foot will be fixed anteriorly while the tibial head is externally rotated, following the opening of the joint and dislocation of the patella. This may lead to internal malrotation in the positioning of the tibial component. That is yet another reason why the tibial tubercle should be used as the most reliable reference. The posterior slope of the tibial plateau governs the width of the flexion gap. Normally, the slope will be about 5 to 7 degrees. The tibial component should be inserted with the same amount of inclination. If the slope is too steep, the knee will be unstable in flexion with increased rollback of the femoral component. This may lead to excessive stress and hence increased wear of the posterior part of the insert. If the slope is not steep enough, the knee will be tight with a flexion deficit. In this case too, the PE insert will be subject to increased stress. Patellar tracking is one of the chief problems in total knee arthroplasty. Some 50% of the complications encountered are due to a poorly centered patella. As mentioned before, correct femoral and tibial component alignment is crucial for correct patellar tracking. If a patellar component is used, the dome should be offset medially to match the normal anatomical pattern. In some cases, centering may be improved by slight lateralization of the femoral component.
The main alignment criteria are Always start the procedure with correctly placed bone cuts. Only after the bone cuts have been made should the ligaments be checked for imbalance and any necessary soft tissue surgery performed. 